Welcome to our uh, seminar part six of our creation seminar. My name is Kent Hovind. I do seminars all over the world on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Dr. Kent Hovind, a creationist and proud of it, a shameless snake oil salesman with a pre-dark age understanding of science, a malignant, self-righteous, criminally ignorant preacher, a spreader of bullshit, an obscurer of truth, a liar, a coward, and a criminal. His PhD was obtained from Patriot Bible University, so even if it can be considered a PhD at all, and not just a waste of time and effort, Patriot Bible University, assuming it's a university rather than a diploma mill, only issues religious degrees. So how Hoeven ever managed to teach high school science for 15 years is unknown. He certainly doesn't have even the most basic understanding of the science he claims to have taught for 15 years, as we shall see. Oh, and by the way, he is currently serving an eight-year sentence in federal prison for tax fraud, which is hardly surprising, considering Hoven's consideration of the theory of evolution as a tax-funded religion, which is either a case of arrogant to quoque or complete and utter stupidity. In this video, I will let Hoven summarise the contents of his previous five seminars, such to set the stage for the debunking of the so-called Hoven theory of the origin and mechanisms of the biblical flood, which Hoven claims is responsible for the vast majority of the world's geology. As we will see, this violates almost all the principles of geology and, well, physics, and exposes Hoven as being the ignorant fool he patently appears to be. So without further ado, let's continue. How could the world completely flood? Where does the Ice Age fit into the Bible? Christians say if the Bible says the Earth is only 6,000 years old, what about... Let's skip the intro a bit. What froze the mammoths? How can you freeze an elephant standing up? Wait, first mistake, Mr. Hoven. A mammoth has never been found frozen while standing up. They've just been stuck, buried, or stuck in a crevasse. We shall return to the standing mammoths later. We're going to cover some of those things tonight in the Hoven theory. And we call it the Hoven theory because we don't want anybody else to get the blame for it, alright? Hmm, does he appear confident? I don't think so. I have read many books by other people. A book that strongly influenced me many years ago was The Biblical Flood and the Ice Epic, how that uh, Patton thinks that an ice meteor struck the earth, or we went through the tail of a comet, one or the other. See, this is the thing with the Hoven theory. It is constructed from various other creationist theories, and woven together to form a tapestry of completely impossible and stupid events that explain a catastrophe revealed in the pages of a 2,000-year-old myth book. Each and every one of the contributors is breathtakingly stupid in their own way, and we will come on to their contributions later. Don Patton, for example, clearly does not understand the most fundamental laws of physics, and is at least a colossal burk as Hovind. Don, I mean, uh, Walt Brown, PhD in physics, uh, Air Force Academy colonel, taught at the Air Force Academy for years, a physics professor. And that, of course, means he is a genius in the fields of geology and geophysics. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the skeptics I debate at universities say, wait, wait, I don't, I don't believe Genesis. How can we trust Genesis? Who wrote that book? And they'll say there are four different authors. The skeptics will say, they call it the, the J-E-P-D for Yahwist, Elohist, Priestly, and Deuterist. And they'll point out that there are very different styles of writing in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, if you look through Genesis 1, it says, and God said, and God did. And it uses the word God 31 times in chapter 1. When you come to chapter 2, verse 4, and all through chapter 2, it uses the phrase, Lord God. You see, this is an interesting observation that Hovind has probably missed. There are actually two creation narratives in the Bible. One described in Genesis 1 depicts God forming the earth and the universe, and therefore forming the plants, animals, and the man. In Genesis 2, God is described as being closer to a gardener, planting the garden of Eden rather than forming it, and filling it with animals rather than forming them. I will not go any further into this because biblical history and literature is not a strong field of mine. All I would say is it's fallacious to interpret the Bible as a top-down chronicle, as do most people, and almost certainly Hoven, and more as a compilation of various religious texts. The Bible says in, in Mark chapter 12, Have you not read in the book of Moses, how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham? Here the Bible clearly tells us that Exodus, where it talks the story about the burning bush, is written by Moses. Oh, Moses didn't exist, by the way. Just saying. Look at that dipshit. Second Peter chapter 3. It says, Knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers. There are people that actually scoff at God's word. How many have ever met one of those before? <laughs> I deal with them all the time. I've had 83 debates, now have four more scheduled in the next two months. Uh, the, the scoffers that scoff at God's word are out there, folks. The woods are full of them. 
okay? And it says they're going to walk after their own lust. The reason they scoff is because of their lust, not because of their science. They don't want God telling them what to do. Now that is just patently not true. I don't care if it's your infallible interpretation of some first century preacher's ramblings, it simply isn't true. I do not debunk creationism so that I don't have to answer to God and feel satisfied that I can continue to watch my gut-wrenching hardcore fetish porn. Seriously, I'm not into that shit. I debunk creationism because it is stupid, ignorant, rubbish. Whether or not I believe in God or find things morally objectionable is absolutely irrelevant in my opinions on creationism. It's not wrong because it limits my moral freedom, it's wrong because it's fucking wrong. And the scoffers are going to say, where's the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Willingly ignorant. In the Greek, that means dumb on purpose. I'm pretty sure neither of the phrases willingly ignorant or dumb on purpose are Greek. Otherwise they would be prosmaia agonia and aliogles gia discopo, respectively. Also, it is important to remember that there is a distinction between stupidity, just not being able to understand something, and ignorance, thinking that you understand something but are just not willing to change your mind, which is arguably far worse and is something which you perfectly embody. And in our seminar part four, we covered some of the scoffers in the history of this, and seminar five, some of the effects of this teaching, how it led to the rise of communism, Nazism, socialism, Marxism. You want Do I need to comment? I don't think so. Marxism. You might want to get that videotape. It's very politically incorrect. You may not want to watch that one, actually. Because there is absolutely no evidence or rational thought in it. I know. Wait, everything you say is like that. We're just going to be there. There will be no time. First thing you do when you get to heaven, take off your watch and fling it over the side. You won't need that anymore. There shall be time and no longer, the angel said. And I assume there will be no space either, since space and time are a continuum. Where are all those souls going to fit? See, you have to have time, space, matter come into existence all simultaneously. If there were matter but were no space, where would you put it? If there were matter and space but no time, when would you put it? You have to have time, space, matter come into existence at the same time. It's called a continuum. It appears he's debunking himself. Wow. Loser. The trinity of trinities. Time has three dimensions, past, present, future. Time is a dimension. Past, present, and future are only ways of referring to time relative to an observer on Earth, just the same way as near and far are ways of measuring space relative to a fixed observer on Earth. At the quantum level, the boundaries between past and future, near and far, start to break down. You can actually get femtoscopic wormholes that flicker in and out of existence at the quantum level. Space has three dimensions, length, width, height. And then time and the hypothetical fifth and sixth dimensions and so on. And matter has three dimensions, solid, liquid, gas. There is a thermodynamic state, not dimensions, you moron. Plasma is just a hotter gas. The crudest statement I have ever heard. Plasma is ionized matter and free electrons. It is not just hot gas, like you. Genesis 1 tells us there was a canopy of water above the creation. What the f***? A giant bubble of water? Surrounding the Earth? How the hell has it been supported there? Even more importantly, how high is it? You say above the creation, and your slide says overhead. So I checked the source, a doctor, Tal Bohr. The page on his website describing the canopy theory is an almost completely unreadable postmodernist word salad, but I found the phrase directly above Earth. So I'm assuming that means it's pressing on the atmosphere. In which case, wow. You have, by the rough portions of your diagram, 1,024 kilometers of liquid water pressing directly on the atmosphere. That means there is 1 billion, 24 million kilograms per square meter, or 10.045 billion pascals of pressure on top of the mere 100,000 pascals of atmospheric pressure at the Earth's surface. Under that pressure, the atmosphere would be completely liquefied and compressed until it was about a meter thick. That means Nero and crew are living in one meter's worth of liquefied atmosphere at 100,255 atmospheres of pressure in complete darkness since merely a kilometer of water filters out all light that enters it. Not to mention that when the canopy somehow disappears, a full 99.999% of that atmospheric pressure disappears. 
This would cause all the liquid water on Earth to boil into superheated steam. And as for Nora and crew? Well... Yeah... Nice work, doctors, Bornhoven, you idiots.